thank you for being here today. Uh, my topic is leadership through service, uh, but the fact that you're here on a nice Saturday afternoon tells me that you already are leaders in your own communities uh, and in your own, among your peers. So, uh, before I get into the content uh, of my talk, I, I want to address a little bit about what I do uh, as a Cook County State's Attorney. Most people here, Cook County State's Attorney, they think criminal prosecutor, and most Cook County State's Attorneys are criminal prosecutors. I'm on the civil side of our office, so what I do is I represent Cook County in all sorts of cases. Uh, it ranges from a recent case that you may have seen in the newspaper, um, where someone challenged the constitutionality of the beverage tax, the sweetened beverage uh, soda tax uh, that Cook County instituted. Uh, we, we represented the county in defending the constitutionality of that. I didn't enact the tax, don't blame me if your soda costs more. That was the county board. We simply defended the constitutionality of the board's action in enacting uh, the tax. Uh, we represent Cook County Hospital uh, in medical litigation. We represent the jail uh, when prisoners sue over their conditions, over things that happen in the jail. We represent the county in any labor dispute, so it's a wide-ranging uh, nature of cases. Uh, I've been, in, uh, I was in private practice for 32 years before I joined the Cook County State's Attorney's Office. Um, and as you heard in the introduction, uh, the kinds of cases I handled ranged from A to Z, antitrust to zoning, and literally everything in between. If you can pick a letter of the alphabet, I can tell you a type of case that I've handled that begins with that letter. Uh, in the course of uh, my years in practice, uh, I've not only engaged in professional endeavors, but I've also engaged in a whole lot of things that are outside of the practice of law that I find satisfying as a person. And what I want to talk about today is how leadership qualities develop out of those kinds of activities, not just what you're doing for a living, there are plenty of leadership opportunities there, certainly, but plenty of leadership opportunities outside the workplace. Uh, and, and I want to go through my experience with that, what I've learned from it. You're going to hear a lot of things that are not original thoughts from me, I'm quote a number of people, because a lot of people spend a lot of time thinking about talking about, uh, collaborating about, what is leadership? What makes a good leader? Who are our leaders? How do we develop leaders? And so I want to touch on, on some of the, the, the people who have written or spoken on topics of leadership that really resonated for me and I find meaning in, and I hope you find meaning in, in them as well. But one of the things that I'm, I'm confident you all have already realized is that leadership qualities exist in different sizes, shapes, in all sorts of different people. There's no one formula for leadership. No one formula. There are lots of qualities that go into being a good leader and becoming a leader, but there's no one path. There's no one set of qualities. But I do want to talk about some things that I, I find are common in the people I respect as leaders. So, uh, so what is leadership? I mean, obviously there are formal positions, a president of an organization, a governor of the state, a senator, those are formal positions. In a company, a manager, a, board, a member of a board of directors, those are formal leadership titles that those people probably earn. I do say probably because there are folks out there who find themselves in leadership positions uh, that uh, you, as somebody that uh, they're leading, may find, how did they get there? Because I don't feel they're a good leader, okay? I'm not casting aspersions on anybody, but we all encounter people that you sometimes scratch your head and say, how did they get to be in that leadership? And in those formal positions, in those people with titles, there is respect for the position, uh, 
and it comes with power and certainly authority, but it's not always leadership by itself. You can have a leadership position and not be a leader. And you don't have to have a leadership position to be a leader. Plenty of ways to be a leader outside of that. So the informal positions of leadership that you can acquire and achieve, when you do that, the respect is not for the title that you have because you may not have that title. It's for you as a leader, as a person, as someone who inspires, motivates, and that's really what being a true leader is about for me. My sense, my experience, is that the best way to leadership is through service to others. There are certainly people who set out and say, I want, to, I want to attain this position. I'm going to you know, take every course, uh, engage in every activity that can get me someplace. Um, but the people who are the true leaders in those organizations tend to be the people who have worked their way through that organization by engaging at the ground level, understanding what it is that is the mission of the organization, what it is that makes the organization tick. It doesn't have to be a formal organization to be informal. Uh, but how does it work? You master that, and people see you in service to others and service to the organization, and they start to look to you uh, for guidance, and that's part of being a leader. Listen, learn, and contribute before walking a path of leadership. Because again, from my perspective, a true leader is someone who walks a path and others choose to follow for lots of reasons. Because they see integrity, they see dedication, they see passion, they see hard work, and they say, that person knows what they're doing. I'm going to follow them. They have good ideas. I'm going to follow them. But when you start walking down that path, you really do want to listen and learn from others who are involved in the same endeavor. If it's an organization, a club, uh, an activity, learn from those who've gone before. Doesn't mean you have to do it the same way that people have gone before you. One of my pet peeves, including with people who I work with, is when I say, like, I'm new to the state's attorney's office. I joined a little over six months ago. And I'll encounter something, and I'll ask people, I'll say, why do we do that that way? And inevitably, the answer, not just there, it's been the answer everywhere I go, well, that's how we've always done it. I say, no, 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 I, I get that you've always done it that way, but why is it that you've always done it that way? Does it make sense? Question, okay? You want to learn, but you want to question. Maybe there's a better way. But I always, I, I always have taken the, the view that you know, you've probably heard the expression, you have two ears and one mouth, and you should use them in that same proportion. Take it a step further. You have two ears, two eyes, and one mouth. Use them in that proportion. Four things to absorb, one thing to express. Okay? So when you start to engage in an activity, in an organization, be it work, be it school, uh, be it you know, charitable, whatever it is, you want to learn from those who have gone before, those who are involved. Doesn't mean, as, as I say, it doesn't mean you have to do it exactly the same way. You'll carve your own path eventually, but you will get the respect of others if you have first learned and contributed through work and through service to the organization. So what is leadership? Here are the four things that I think make a good leader. Committed. Being absolutely committed to what you're doing. That, that takes many forms. And as I'll address in a minute, for me, you know, when I get involved in something, I'm all in. I don't dabble here, dabble there, dabble someplace else. Okay? 
If I'm in, I'm all in. Uh, there's an old saying, and I think it's a, actually a Buddhist saying, uh, that how you do anything is how you do everything. And that's sort of the approach I take to volunteer opportunities I have. It's the way I approach my work. It's a pro the way I approach the professional activities I engage in. If I'm going to undertake something, I want to do it right. And I engage in that listening and learning and working at the ground level first to understand how the organization works, what works, what doesn't work. Um, but I'm going to be all in. I'm going to have that commitment. <clears throat> Service. Service is good just by itself. It'll make you feel good. And the fact that you're here tells me that you're committed and involved. And I'm sure you experience that feeling that when you're in service of others, it feels good all by itself. Nobody has to recognize you. Nobody has to give you, you know, an award for participating. It feels good. Yeah, you know, getting recognized is nice too. But the service and the help that you can give others is a reward unto itself. Passion. Lots of things you can get involved in. Where you will end up being the leader is in an area where you have some passion around the topic, around the organization, around the cause. Because when you have that passion, you work harder at it, you work better at it. The passion that others see in you inspires others. It motivates others. They get involved. But soon you've got to gather. And you're the leader of that, naturally. You may not be the head of the organization, but the passion that you bring to that work inspires others. That's leadership. Finally, knowing your why. And this comes from a guy named Simon Sinek, uh, who is uh, not a cynic. It's not spelled like C-Y-N-I-C. Um, okay? It's S-I-N-E-K. He's a, uh, a management guru, if you will, um, a thought leader, a motivator. Uh, he's somebody who's, you know, I, I subscribe to his daily email. Um, you know, it's a, it's a thought about leadership. It's a thought about commitment to uh, organizations. It's a thought about being a good person every day. And for me, he's somebody uh, who is a leader and helps me develop leadership skills. And so we're going to talk a little bit about him and his main thought, which is understanding the why. Not the how and the what, but the why of what you do and what an organization does. So the first item I mentioned as, as part of leadership is commit. And this is uh, a quote from Abraham Lincoln that for years I have found a great deal of meaning Commitment is what transforms a promise into reality. It is the words that speak boldly of your intentions and the action which speaks louder than words. It is the making of time when there is none, coming through time after time, year after year. Commitment is the stuff character is made of. The power to change the face of things. It is the daily triumph of integrity over skepticism. I actually came across this for the first time uh, when an uncle of mine passed away. Uh, I was preparing the eulogy uh, to give at his funeral service. He was a high school football coach. And I was going through yearbooks from the high school where he taught at and served as a football coach. And this quote was in one of those yearbooks. And it struck me, I said, you know, that, that defines his life. That, I think, defines the way I've approached things. And I embraced that quote ever since, 25 some odd years ago. It's something I look at every now and then. Because there are certainly times when you think, oh, I'm overworked, uh, I've taken on too many things. I remind myself of these words. And I remember, 
The reason I have these opportunities to serve, the reason I have some leadership roles uh, in the workplace and in, in uh, community organizations is because this is my approach to everything. So as I mentioned, um, there's another point about passion. Um, being deeply involved in something, you have to have passion in order to, to do that well. There are certainly people who take the view that, well, to become a leader, you need to join every club. You need to be in every organization. You need to do everything. And there are people, the rare person can pull that off successfully. For most people, what it tends to be is, you know, sort of a false way to leadership. It's maybe resume building. They've got, you know, a ton of activities, a ton of organizations they can list that they get involved in. And you know, I, I do a lot of interviewing uh, in my prior law firm. I was on the recruiting committee, go on campus, interview lots of students uh, who want to come join our law firm. And inevitably, the people who have that long list of organizations, when I start asking, what did you do with them? It's, oh, you know, I, I went to this one thing. Oh, okay, well, um, how did you contribute to the success? And it was more about them getting something out of going to a bunch of different things. The students I was impressed with and the people I know we hired who tend to be the successful lawyers are the people who don't spread themselves out too thin, but they find different things that they are passionate about and they are fully and deeply committed uh, to those few things. So I encourage you, you know, you try a lot of things. Nothing wrong with trying a lot of things, and if that builds a long list, that's okay. But the key is, find what you're passionate about, and really devote yourself to that. The key really is the service that you give when you're involved in something and you're passionate about it, because uh, that's what motivates others. As I say, you know, people see you very active, working hard, especially when it's a volunteer role. That inspires others, wow. You know, that, that person really, they're into it. I want to catch that. People want to be excited about what they're doing, and they want to be involved in things they can be excited about. And that excitement is contagious. Engage in it fully. You can model those good feelings that you get from being involved and accomplishing things and helping others. That, that'll rub off on other people. Some people uh, take the view that, that being involved is sort of networking, uh, it poses networking opportunities, and networking is important. Uh, whatever, whatever field you go into, you're gonna wanna network in your field and outside your field, because the, the broader base of contacts you have, the better, because you'll never know when somebody you've met along the way is gonna help you, okay? I know I found that you know, things that I've done that I had no idea I didn't do it because I thought I'd meet a lot of interesting people who could help me in my career. But one of the things both my wife and I did when we were first married before we had kids, is we volunteered to tutor on Saturday mornings at an inner city school. Okay. We did that for about three years. It was every Saturday during the school year. And to us it was fun. We didn't have kids yet. We were trying to figure out, do we want to have kids? Um, how do you, you know, how do you deal with kids? So it was a little bit of learning for us. And we thought we were helping the kids, and, and we certainly did, and we were passionate about it, and we were committed to it. We were there week after week. But one of the odd things about it is, years later, somebody who was a tutor with us was in a position in a business uh, to need legal services and became a client. It was a good client. I didn't engage in that activity to help build business in my law practice. And who knew tutoring in an inner city school would develop that kind of an opportunity? But it did, because people recognized that they, they remembered me. They knew I was a lawyer. They knew I practiced in that area. And they knew I was committed. They knew I was passionate. And they needed somebody like that. And so they turned to me. 
So networking does happen naturally when you are in service to others. So going through the motions, just you know, as I mentioned, you know, just joining organizations just so you can list it, that's not going to get you leadership. That doesn't develop leadership qualities, that doesn't put you in a leadership position. Leadership requires that effort when you're learning and, and contributing and absorbing. You're doing it because you have that passion. And it's enjoyable to you. It should be enjoyable to you. Because if it's not, find something else to do. Find another organization. Find another activity. Because you do need to have that passion in order to, to get that good feeling out of your contributions. You don't want to feel like, oh, I got to do that again. Oh, it's such a drain. Okay? That tells me that, yes, you're contributing, but you're not getting that good feeling because maybe you're not feeling like you're helping that you're doing things, but you're not helping. But if you find something you're passionate about and you can move that, uh, that effort forward, you will get that good feeling of contribution. The trust that you gain from others who are engaged in the same activity through your commitment, through your passion, that's key to them putting their trust in you as a leader. That's when they're gonna decide, I wanna follow this person not just on Twitter, but following before Twitter. There still was following. It's a whole different meaning now. So as I mentioned, Simon Sinek, and starting with uh, why. He's, he's, he speaks on a whole number of topics. Um, and one of the things I commend to you is you know, go on TED Talks. Are you guys familiar with TED Talks? First of all, there's a ton of great stuff there. He's got a bunch of stuff there. He's got his own website as well, where you can watch his videos. Uh, terrific speaker, very motivating, and a lot of it is focused on leadership. But sort of at his core is his notion of starting with why. And he def what he defined as the golden circle, and he's, he's borrowed it from uh, others as well and developed on it. He said, in every organization, you have these things. You've got the what. What is it that they do? Okay? But that doesn't define their mission. It just defines how, how they do it. Okay? He uses the example of Apple Computer as a company that truly understands its why. They've got their what down pat. They know exactly what they're doing. And they know exactly how to do it, down to a science. But what separates them from all other computer companies, because at the end of the day, that's kind of what they are, is their understanding of why it is they do what they do. Simon Sinek gives a great example of the MP3 player. They didn't develop it. Dell Computer makes a fabulous MP3 player. Nobody bought it because they didn't understand the why. They understood the what and the how. And they could execute on a business plan and the technology. But they didn't understand what moves people. People make decisions through their emotions more than their logic. Apple understands that. Apple understands the why that they make something that changes the way you can live. And by the way, they've got cameras, they've got laptops, they've got computers, iPads, iPhones, but it's all, at the end of the day, technology that lots of companies make. But why does Apple have the market share it has because people identify with the passion that they bring, the why that Apple has at their core uh, understanding what it is they do and most important, why. So there, there's a philosophy known as servant leadership. And it's both a philosophy, uh, you know, 
that can, that's taught not just in business schools, uh, but you know, in, in all sorts of endeavors. And it's also a set of practices uh, that sort of centered around the notion that true leadership is gained through serving others. I don't want to get overly political, but I want to draw a contrast between the reactions and the approach two different presidents took to two different hurricanes. We saw President Trump recently in Houston, Texas, and never, never waded into the waters, literally or figuratively, never went to where the destruction was, held a press conference, and then had an impromptu little rally. And his words struck me. He said, what a great turnout. Sure, people are out of their houses. But he was thanking them for coming to see him. He, his vision of leadership is, I'm strong, you follow me. Compared to uh, Hurricane Sandy, when President Obama walked among the neighborhoods that had been destroyed, personally consoling people door to door. That's more of a servant leadership style. Again, everybody can have your own style. There are certainly success stories. President Trump is a success um, taking his approach. But I think you'll find more satisfaction and ultimately, ultimately more success taking uh, the servant approach to leadership. Without getting overly religious in the Christian faith, the notion that Jesus washed the feet of the apostles. No greater example servant leadership than that. That look, the, you know, the Pope replicates that now. Leaders are serving others. Others choose to follow those who serve them and their interests. So, leadership, what is it going to be for you? What's your passion? What excites you? What, satisfy, what, what activities do you get, engage in that give you satisfaction? Those are the areas where you're going to be viewed as a leader. A few final uh, thoughts. Um, when you are a leader, you're busy. You've got a lot of things going on. You've got work. You've got the the extracurricular activities you're involved in, the organizations, the clubs, uh, the community groups. Really important to find some time management system that works for you because you will be pulled in a lot of different directions. And that notion of commitment being there day after day, you know, year after year, requires good time management skills. And part of good time management is identifying those priorities. What is important to you? Where do you want to expend your efforts? And finally, mindfulness. Mindfulness is a whole lot more than meditation. Mindfulness is being in that moment. So when you're engaged in some uh, charitable activity, some volunteer, be there in that moment. People can tell when people are distracted. And they're, you know, they're there, but they're someplace else. Okay? Be there because that'll help you get more out of it and that'll show others how to get things out of those activities. That'll show your passion. That will develop in those others the desire to follow you. So here are a few resources. Um, you know, TED Talks, I know you're all familiar with. Uh, Simon Sinek guy who um, is, as, as I tell you, is a bit of a muse for me um, in terms of leadership. That's his website, Start With Why, or you can find lots of his talks on TED Talks as well. Mindful.org, lots of great stuff there. And again, not just on meditation, but how to be in the moment, how to really fully engage in what you're doing. Lots of great support materials there. And with that, I'd like to open it up uh, to questions. So the lunch, the sugar rush. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
just you know, one last slide. You know, being here today, as I mentioned at the outset, tells me that you guys are leaders. Okay? Um, there are other things that you could be doing today, but you chose to invest in yourself and in your future. You're going to benefit from that down the road, and those who are engaged in activities with you, your peers, will benefit from the learning that you're doing here today and the commitment that you're showing today. Well, we'll open it up to anything, including questions about what was your favorite trial you've ever done or anything else. That to me, that is the number one 
factor that's common with leadership. And, and that's really what you're doing. I mean, it's a great observation. You're leading that jury to, you're not telling them what to do. You're leading them to the conclusion that you believe is right based on the evidence. And you are the one they trust to walk down that path. Yeah? Uh, what was the reason behind that? Lots of people are making a big deal about it. Um, really, you know, from the county board's perspective, twofold. Um, one, and they, they may put it in reverse order, but I know the real orders, number one, they need the revenue to plug a hole in the budget. Uh, but number two, um, studies have shown that, you know, and, and it stands to reason through logic, if you tax something, people will consume less of it. That's happened with cigarettes, with alcohol, you tax it, they'll, be, they'll consume it less. And sugar-based drinks um, clearly you know, contribute to obesity, diabetes, all sorts of health problems. And the single largest item in the county's budget is health services through the county hospital and, and the clinics. So their number one expense is health care. And the design was this, you know, it's not going to be dramatic, but this over time will help contain some of those health care costs. But candidly, number one, they needed the revenue. Cook 
being by far and away the largest. We're the first, probably also most in need uh, of those additional revenues. Um, I think the other counties will take a, a wait and see approach. Certainly there are counties like DuPage and Lake right on the border that say, well, you keep that tax, our businesses on the other side of the county line are gonna do well because people come over. Um, but you know, over time, as you know, people complain about property taxes, they say, well, we got no more property taxes. Uh, okay, well, we gotta find some way to fund the services and the activities of government that we all need and want. So that, that's one option, is the better state. So um, I'm being told time's up. So I wanna thank you very much I appreciate you having me here. I want to thank ITAC for inviting me, and uh, I hope to see you all again in some